Greetings and welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic. I am your host, Ted Flanagan, and I'm joined by Greg Poshman. He's a Pitkin County, Colorado commissioner who is passionate about maintaining the quality of life and the quality of development in the Roaring Fork Valley of Colorado. Hey, Greg, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Ted, and I, I appreciate you inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast and uh, a pleasure to meet you for the first time. So, Right. Well, After hearing about you for 30 plus years and, and you know, in the same circles, uh, it's, it's great to finally have this conversation. Well, super. What, what's on the docket uh, this week in your, in your world as a commissioner? Uh, well, what has been on the docket is um, that, that our, our county staff has asked us to consider um, floating a, a ballot measure for to raise uh, possibly property taxes, maybe some other sales or lodging tax uh, for building affordable housing in our community. Um, like the entire country, we have an affordable housing problem. Um, and I keep pointing that out. Uh, it's not just here. We used to think it was just us who had an affordable housing problem. And so we started working on it 40 plus, almost 50 years ago. And we have probably the highest percentage of affordable housing units, deed restricted affordable housing of any place in the nation. And, and uh, yet we still have a problem with affordable housing for a number of different reasons. Uh, but meanwhile, the state has caught up to us. Now, virtually every small town in Colorado has an affordable housing problem, workforce housing problems, um, as does the nation. And they, they blame it on the recession in 2008, 2009 kind of killed the housing construction market and, and we've been playing catch up ever since. Um, it seems that the mountain communities in Colorado actually have it worse than most places. And so we're, you know, we're trying to figure out how to address that while also trying to keep an eye on our, our, our I'm gonna say the mandate we have to, to grow slowly. We have a, a slow growth policy in place for 40, 50 years and we try to maintain a rural bucolic sort of environment in our incredible beautiful uh, high mountain valley and and that's a challenge you know how do you take care of your workforce but maintain your rural nature and right. so really good urban planning uh becomes more and more essential and i think my biggest challenge is trying to bring everyone along on let's put the density closer to the jobs closer to the transit you know those those so that's what my thing is but honestly, the biggest thing that's always back of my mind and center is that we, we declared a climate emergency at the behest of some of our local school children uh, about five years ago when I was the, the chair of the Board of Commissioners. And, and uh, we've been taking that seriously. And I think about that every day because the, the existential crisis around climate change and carbon emissions um, is uh, job one for me. And think if, you know, on my epitaph, if yeah. I have an epitaph, it will it will say you know he he did his best to to avert an existential crisis wow. so hopefully there'll be somebody there to read that in 100 years i hope a lot of people have that epitaph too <laughs> <laughs> but that's fantastic and and greg is the, is the geography of the valley one of those reasons that we have this affordable housing crisis that for for the sake of our listeners i mean we've got aspen very wealthy high end uh, up at the well it's at, like it's at the southeastern end of the valley sort of turned around but it's a uh, and then you got a very long valley the roaring fork valley i guess all the way down to glenwood which is what about 25 30 miles or 40 miles even 42 miles from aspen 42 but, it, but the, uh, the valley is so narrow that it doesn't it doesn't really afford as many spots i guess as other places well the, the thing is that people talk about carrying capacity and that's an interesting question because carrying capacity isn't just real estate it's the ability to to house to provide services to, to provide water transportation all, all that sort of thing um and and our probably our biggest limitation which we love to ignore in the west across the entire west is water you know uh we have uh the roaring fork river wa watershed here um about 60 percent of that is now diverted tra through trans mountain diversions to the front range of Colorado, which is growing like crazy. Um, and so we see our water resources dwindling and our supply, our, our reservoirs aren't up to the task of, 
the you know, providing endless water like everybody else downstream from us is there are about 40 million people downstream using the water that we send that way we're at the top of the watershed so we're the first users if it does flow west and and that's so that's a huge limiting factor we also had we put in a very strong growth control and land use code measures 40 50 years ago commissioners back in the 70s uh, because they wanted to we had about a 26 percent annual growth rate back in the late 60s and that it didn't last long before the commissioners decided they we couldn't sustain that we don't want to be the next hong kong we're not trying to build a a, a major city and so uh major growth restrictions went in and so as a result the supply being limited the beauty of the nat natural resources the ski areas all that drove um, a real estate boom in high end, you know, the prices keep going up. And so our price appreciation has been phenomenal. And if you happen to own land in this part of the, the world, you'll, you know, the housing appreciation is greater than probably anywhere else and, and has been, a and, and, and people don't, you know, don't fail to notice that. So we've got a very strong high end real estate market, which makes it harder, harder to house the employees who drive the buses or the deputy sheriffs clean the toilets and, and all those things. So our challenge right now and what I keep pounding the table about is that we really need to take care of the people who take care of us. Oh. So um, and, anyway. Uh, uh, Greg, you came, you you were born in Aspen, uh, I, I believe in the Aspen Hospital as my kids were. Uh, in 1959, uh, you've seen this valley grow and, and, and develop. And I, I must say as, a, as a, somebody who comes back frequently, but I don't live here. I'm always impressed at how beautiful it is and how well the development has taken place. But are you are you comfortable with what's taken place over the course of your lifetime? I prefer what's taken place to what the alternative would be. Because we were, we were talking about carrying capacity earlier before I, I, I can go tangential on these things. So you've got to pull me back in. But, uh, you know, I prefer what has happened with the growth control measures to what the alternative would have been. Because um, I think we would have had well over 100,000 residents in our upper valley probably by the 1980s had nothing happened. And, and as a result, now we have a county which has about 18,000 residents on the census. We think that's an, a huge undercount. Um, but we also know we have a lot of second homeowners. We're thinking we probably have uh, in the high season about 55,000 people a day are crossing on the bridge into town and in the valley. And in the low season, the off seasons, maybe it's down to 35 or so. But our census says we have 18,000 actual residents here. So we have a lot of commuters. We have a lot of people here. That level of growth uh, in our county has been two plus percent, while the adjoining counties, Eagle County is growing at about 7%. That's a doubling every 10 years or so. Garfield County, which is 40 miles down, uh, almost 35 miles down is growing at, I think, a 10 or 11% rate. That's a doubling every six years. Um, we're not okay with we have our, we have, like that. When we have our growth management in place, that keeps that keeps the valley looking absolutely beautiful. And therefore, <laughs> therefore the higher, the, the more people want to come here and enjoy that. And the wealthy one well, yeah. moves here. And so what a dichotomy it kind of creates in the valley. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, I, I think back to Amory Levin's comment, which I, I used to sit at his feet because I would record video of him whenever we needed to do an interview for television, things like that. And I just remember him saying the, the all the problems we have are caused by the solutions to the previous problems. And, you know, the, the laws of unintended consequences or, you know, being stuck in a rock in a hard place, you know, the, whatever changes we make and ever rules we, we put in, uh, create the next set of problems. And, and Amory said it very succinctly, more than I do. But I appreciate that. And, and I, I think about it all the time. Uh, but get, uh, finally, on the carrying capacity issue, I think Hong Kong has about the same geographic usable land, you know, uh, than we do. And they've got like five or six million residents in a, in a valley as big as ours. So when we talk about carrying capacity, you have to say, well, what do you actually mean? If we wanted to stuff six million people into this valley and high rises we probably could but certainly that's not our ambition and and we're trying our best to keep that rural nature feeling we we, we have a lot of open space preserved as you probably know we have a lot of wilderness surrounding us and and uh you know i i think of my my chief constituency i'll i'll tell everyone are the elk you know i 
I look at the elk herds as my my the constituents I look out for because they don't really have a voice. So I'm, I try to be their voice. And, and I think about trying to preserve these open spaces and, and wild herds and, and open lands. And, and that is a challenge, but we've been quite successful at it, I have to say. Yeah, I can tell you're, you're, you're passionate and I, I appreciate what you're doing in this valley. And I want to make sure I just mentioned uh, on the podcast that that your mother was a, a, a quite a skier, right? And and your and your father was actually in the tenth mountain division, uh, right? Which you know is, in my view, it's just an unbelievable thing that you have that in your roots. Yeah. And they, and I was they, lucky. I was incredibly lucky. My my father discovered skiing when he was a kid in Pennsylvania, and then he moved to Southern California when during the Depression, nineteen twenty nine. I think he was eight. Was he eighteen? He was 15 and 29. So when he was 18, the family moved, lost everything in Pennsylvania, moved to San Diego, and he ended up joining the San Diego as a founding member of the San Diego Ski Club. And they they tried water skiing on boards on the you know in the bay. They went up to the mountains and built their own chairlifts and or ski toes out of Model T axles and motors and you know wheels. They did that sort of thing. And so when the the ski troops formed in Second World War. He happened to be driving back from a ski trip and he heard about Pearl Harbor and he and his friends said, hey, we've got to join up. Let's get the ski troops. And over time, they were, he was able to. And so uh, he discovered Colorado then and and became a ski instructor for the 10th Mountain Division. So he actually taught winter, you know, survival and mobility skills to the 10th Mountain yeah, Troopers. Camp Hale, probably, right? He was at Camp Hale and he was at Camp Hale. Yeah, he, he rode in on a blacked out train to a secret base and somewhere in the mountains, and it happened to be Camp Hale. Um, and he taught skiing there as a part of a group called the Mountain Training Group. And, and he said, we were just a damn ski club. You know, he, he had a really good time there teaching the generals and the privates alike how to ski. Um, but then he also had to learn the rest of what it takes to be a soldier. And, and in the war in Italy and uh, on Kiska, they had their first uh, expedition was to the Aleutian Islands. Um, he was a machine gun. He had a machine gun squad. He was a sergeant. He had a machine gun squad. And I think his greatest pride was that he brought back his squad alive from those horrendous battles in the Italian Apennines where, where you know, huge numbers of, of 10th Mountain troops were killed. And uh, his guys all came back in fairly good stead. And he, he told himself as he was being shelled and shot at that if he survived this, he just wanted to ski, and he, he did his best to protect his knees. And so he came back, and he and, and, and your parents, uh, what they came to Aspen in 1950, I think I read. Uh, they, uh, yeah, he helped build the first chairlift in in the winter of 46, 47, the number one chairlift. He worked as a, you know, putting the wheels on the towers, um, and then they, uh, my grandmother had been to the Goethe Bicentennial here. She was a Swiss a psychologist and professor at DU in Denver. And, and she uh, told my parents, if you want to marry, um, there's one place I would, you know, I'd give you my, my blessing. And that would be Aspen because it's the only place that has a future. That was 1949. And she was right because no other ski area had a pulse back then. And Aspen was starting to, to happen. So my mom, um, who had had been a, a climber and a skier in the Colorado Mountain Club, uh, went to CU Boulder uh, about two, uh, two, you know, I guess two years into her term at CU. She uh, she was in a sorority. It was I guess just during the war and wasn't. She said, "I just want to take some time off and go skiing." So she 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 knew she wasn't a good fit for the sorority because she would rappel out the window of her room to avoid the bridge games when she would go climbing. Uh, she went to Alta, Utah in, in 1946, spring of or late 45. She met my father, who who had just come back from the war in Alta. And, uh, and she saw him walk into the Alta Lodge where she was a waitress. And she said, I'll, I'll take that one to one of her friends. And and they went skiing together and, and that sealed the deal. That they were both that. good skiers. Yeah. So anyway, that's how we got here. Pretty yeah. great roots, Greg. And then uh, you grew up in the Aspen area, obviously skiing a lot and mountaineering a lot. And then went to University of Colorado in Boulder, majored in engineering. That sounds like maybe your father's influence, but but you you came out of that and really filmmaking became your thing. Right. Yeah. I I went thinking that one we we didn't have a lot of money. Skiers, ski bums, and skiers don't really you know make a lot of money. 
So I went to the CU trying to figure out how am I going to survive? So I chose the most challenging thing I could, and it was an engineering and business degree. Um, and, uh, and I ended up with a degree in architectural civil engineering with a solar emphasis. It was, it was the year that Ronald Reagan decided to kill all the solar energy funding. And so I, I chose a, a field that we kind of went away. Um, but at the same time, I also discovered uh, documentary filmmaking. And, and that became my career. I, I started working on ski films with some, you know, well-known ski filmmakers like Dick Durrance and Roger Brown at Summit Films, and Ski the Outer Limits and all those old movies from the late 60s, which were the things I grew up on. I got to go work with my heroes who were making films. And, and, those, and it went from ski films to adventure documentaries and wildlife films. I ended up traveling all over the world um, in the late 80s, mid to late 80s. 90s and, and virtually every month I'd be on a different continent in a different exotic location filming some fascinating character doing something really interesting and and I just had a fantastic run I was doing you know lions leopards cheetahs bears whales giant squid you know you name it all over the globe and then adventures we did river expeditions in Siberia and we did a balloon flight around the world attempt several you know, films about this attempt that uh, Richard Branson was going to do um, with some other guys. And uh, they never made it around the world, but I had a spectacular time following them and, and meeting, you know, filming, looking over their shoulder. So I, got, so I got to work with the likes of Richard Leakey and Jonathan Scott in Kenya and Sylvia Earle and, and uh, Valerie Taylor, the great underwater filmmakers and shark experts, Peter Benchley, the the author of Jaws was with us a lot of the time, and and Stan Waterman, who was kind of like America's answer to Jacques Cousteau, the spectacular author and writer and filmmaker who 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 uh, used to give film lectures in the days before they actually had really good ways of, of distributing films. They would take their films around and lecture. So uh, from Peter and Stan, uh, I learned a little bit about repartee and. And how to how to entertain a crowd. Those guys were so much fun to be with because they were always laughing and joking and had a great irreverent humor. And um, if nothing, I try to I try to emulate them as best I can. Now along the way, uh, and congratulations, three times you won an, an Emmy award for your filmmaking. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the I'm trying to remember the first one. Uh, was for a series we did, uh, and it involved wildlife and ex expedition filmmaking all over the world. And I was part of a crew that made these films, and and uh, I was working my way up. You know, I'd started as a sound man and an assistant cameraman, and you know, dying to get a, your hands on a camera that could shoot television quality film back then was very difficult. It was 16 millimeter film. It costs about a dollar a foot to shoot, so they wouldn't just give a camera to anybody. And the cameras are hundred thousand dollars. And I think now my my iPhone here has higher quality imagery. You know, it's, it's just it's just mind blowing. But back then it was really hard to get into that field, and so I worked up over a decade or so until I was a cameraman and then a director. And and um, and so yeah, we won Emmys for um, that series, and then uh, I made a film, a children's very low cost children's film about kids who are pen pals between Aspen, Colorado, our aces. Aspen Center for Environmental Studies and kids in Malawi who had a, a nature center on a lake very similar to our Hallam Lake. And, and we, uh, we filmed a pen pal relationship that actually became a video relationship when we took the cameras over and the screens over so they could all communicate. We made a film about that on an extremely low budget. And um, we thought, well, you know, this will never go anywhere. But then Disney found it and bought it and picked it up. And we put us into the Emmy category. And I went to the Emmys thinking, this is a waste of time. And uh, Lawrence Fishburne handed me an Emmy at the end of the night. And, and uh, I was, I was, I'm still in shock about that. And then it happened again with another project I did with Sting. Um, I think I only worked with him for two days in Paris, filming him, uh, making a, a film. But they won for the entire, you know, concert film background and all that. And, uh, and so I was happy to be included in that group too. So I, that one, I didn't have to, it was hard work because that was a challenging job just for the few days I worked on it. But, um, you know, sometimes you get lucky. That's great. Oh, it's good. Or stuff. maybe you always get lucky and maybe I always get lucky. 
Oh, well, you've gotten lucky a few, a few yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> done, done well, done well, very three cheers. In 2016, you decided to become a county commissioner here in Pitkin County. Right. You know, yeah. that's a quick and easy story if you want to hear it. Um, Why did you do that? I, de- I delivered a film. I made a film for a client uh, who happened to be in the Valley about a, a project that they do in Africa. And, and he said, this is, a, this is fantastic. I love the film. It's exactly what I wanted. And he said, hey, I've got this idea. You know, you should run for county commissioner. And, and uh, the, the thought had never occurred to me. And I was actually insulted at first. I thought, wait a minute, I, I've just handed this piece of creative work. I'm an artist. I've given you this film and you're telling me to change careers. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but he said, no, seriously, you should talk to talk to your people you trust and see what they say. And so I I talked to various friends that I, I rely on for advice and, and they kind of laughed into their sleeves and said, sure, you should do that, ha ha. Um, and so I did. And and it turns out I I... I won the primary. I had two opponents in the primary. Won the primary, and then won the general. Um, and uh, and it was like being thrown into the deep end of a swimming pool. It, it's like going to. It's almost like I guess you could say it's like going to graduate school in a way. <clears throat> All of a sudden, a, a full caseload of things to to work on and study and 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 start uh, providing my input on policy. Uh, and so it's been an incredible education. I got reelected after the first four years. I, nobody ran against me. Um, I guess I must be an intimidating figure. Uh, so nobody ran against me after four years. And I'm in my halfway through my second term. I'll, I could run one more time. And I'm contemplating that now. It'd be about a year before I decide. Um, but the thing that I, the reason I think I would do it again is I feel as if I'm making a positive difference. And that brings us back to, you know, climate change, electrification, the, the issues of the day, which I think are essential global crises. But we have uh, a local, a local way of dealing with them. And as as Hal Harvey says, you know, perhaps the most way you can best effective thing you can do um, is to be doing this on a local level. So I'm taking that seriously and trying to make a difference locally. A big issue, a big issue that you're dealing with, and I think it's, I think it's hugely complex. I don't claim to understand it. Is the Aspen Airport? Can you kind of, right. can you encapsulate what the issue is? I know you got, I know there's commercial flights coming in and out, and then it's a very busy airport for private aviation. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, the airport was started um, back probably in the late '40s, early '50s. It was a dirt strip. Um, one of our esteemed local commissioners, Tom Sardi. You know, was really the whip to you know to make this thing go. Um, and uh, then back in the day, we had old DC threes and Convairs would come in. Aspen Airways, um, they actually put a, a Jado rocket assist on the bottom of it in case they needed to electric boost getting out of our valley. Where we have a one way single runway airport, uh, which is unusual for a really busy airport, and uh, and we're at the end of a valley with big mountains. And so the big challenge is, is climbing up out of there uh, because you're climbing up out over a populated area, the ski areas and the residential areas right at the bottom of the flight path of leaving the airport. So our, that airport has been going great, working fine. But up in the last 15 or 20 years, it has gotten so busy. We have over 300,000 employments a year now. Um, 83% of our traffic is is general aviation. So we have a we have private jets stacked up coming and going, delivering people. Uh, and then we probably have 30 or 40 parked at the, at the airport on the tarmac at any given time. And it basically have filled it up. We have two airlines or at least one contractor, SkyWest contracts to both uh, United and Delta, I think. Is it Delta? I'm blanking. It must be Delta. Um, and they're running uh, you know, commercial flights to, uh, to cities around the country now. And and uh, into Denver, and it's become extraordinarily busy. It's a uh, uh, we're starting to see air quality problems and noise problems. Um, the popularity of our ski resort in our valley is has grown to the point now where a lot of people are asking, you know, how much is enough? Do we want to keep growing to accommodate this, or do we want to start thinking of different ways that we can thrive here uh, without having to grow bigger to do so? As we say that. You know, it's it's uh, 
it's the ecology of the cancer cell to have to keep growing to, to survive and thrive. But with um, the airport, and, with and the maybe, airport, is it simply a matter of extending the runway? So that, is there a desire to bring bigger planes in? Or well, our runway has been extended already as far as it can. But uh, um, for safety reasons, and, and the FAA has had a huge push to, to standardize virtually everything in every airport. They want every airport to have the same standards. We've had exceptions with cur uh, flight curfews and modifications of standard when they want to get rid of those. And that would require us to widen our runway. If we widen our runway, it would allow a wider wingspan aircraft, which would put us up into the full category three of an airport which could allow much larger aircraft to come in. And the big fear, I think it may be the boogeyman, and I'm not even sure it's real, is that people are concerned that 737s full of package, you know, industrial tourism sort of package deal tourists will start flying in here in 737s. Um, I don't think that's physically likely because it's just too bloody dangerous. Um, we do have private 737s have come in because there's only one guy on board or two guys and seven dogs, you know, on board the plane. But a fully laden 737 will probably never fly in here. And, and the, the FAA tells us that and our consultants tell us that. But still, that's the big fear of widening our runway because the FAA has rules about discrimination. If an aircraft is capable of flying into a location, you cannot discriminate against it. So we have got a narrower 100-foot runway right now. It'll accept a 95-foot wingspan. Um, if we go over 95 feet, it goes into a larger, scarier class of aircraft. Very different than the airport are the wildlife crossings that I know you've been a champion of or advocate of. And here we've got this Highway 82. People are rocking up and down the valley, uh, getting to work or getting to the skiers or whatever. And wildlife are being killed, all, all deer being deer and elk, I suppose. And uh, how is that going with, with getting support for wildlife crossings where you actually create overpasses over these? Right. Well, there are several ways to create safer crossings for wildlife, overpasses being one, underpasses, certain fencing scenarios, signage, um, and alert systems. There may be, hopefully, I keep pushing our people to start innovating, looking for new technology on um, innovate, innovative ways to alert animals to, to turn around or go back and to let drivers know that their animals present on a dark night on a dark highway. You know, we have things like LIDAR and we've got other sensing technology now, which is so good and, and getting less expensive that perhaps there are other solutions because a, an overpass is five to 10, probably 10 million bucks. Um, the state of Colorado, unfortunately, does not have very much money for wildlife overpasses, although they should. Other states around us have, you know, five and 10 times as much in terms of resources for that. So that's something we have to work on at a state level. But locally, there's a lot of interest in it. And a new nonprofit is formed. It's called Safe Passages Roaring Fork Valley. And uh, we've got a very uh, dynamic young woman at startup, Cicely uh, D'Angelo. And, and we, I've been supporting her the best I can, helping her build a board, introducing her to donors, uh, helping navigate the things you have to do to get a nonprofit going and build a public movement. And, and uh, she's up and rolling. We're going to do our, uh, the first studies on where the overpasses should go and then start figuring out what it would take to actually get some put in here on this very busy highway. And, and, and we're looking at an elk herd and large ungulate herd that's declined by 50% in the last 20 years. So uh, collisions are part of that, as well as incursions into their habitat just from subdivisions and things like that. Uh, so that's near and dear to me. Yeah, I can tell. Greg, you've you've um you've been involved now in the as a public servant for what six seven years now. I, I I've read a little bit about um you know some of the the shock that you had about the criticism that the public would in, you know lay out on elected officials like like yourself and how you've had to become thick skinned. But I and also I was fascinated by you know that you you went into public service with, with high hopes, of course. Uh, and then found out, I guess I quote you saying, the public process is really complicated. Um, are, you, are you optimistic? And I think the county commission has been maybe exceptional as a body, but are you optimistic with the process and the way that you've been able to con control the growth in the valley and sustain that quality of life that you're, you're so passionate about? Um, I am. I, I have to say, I, I have no choice but to be an optimist, but it's not a hard choice. I am an optimist. 
Um, you certainly see changing. As you know, you leave town for two weeks, you come back and something's changed. Our, this is a very dynamic town. It has been my entire life. So yes, I'm optimistic about it. Um, uh, there was more to that question. Um, but, uh, but I also see progress where we're, we are doing our best to protect the big, vast tracts of open space and lands that should be preserved, the riparian zones, super important. You know, that, that supports 95% of our wildlife. We rely on the riparian areas along the rivers. We're, we're doing our best to preserve those. We're preserving uh, the connectivity of the corridors for wildlife habitat, which happens to be at a 90 degree um, intersection with our highways. The highways basically cut right through the habitat. So that's the, where we come back to the overpasses. So I, I have to say, I am optimistic. And also, I've gone from being impatient with the public process, which is painfully slow, to also realizing that we need it because we often need to go in and check in, which we do a lot with our community, um, to make sure we're getting it right and to make sure we understand what's going on. Um, I think I'm at a point now as a, as, as a approaching senior member of the commission that I'm grateful for a slow contemplative process because... We've got to get through the bad ideas before we can actually settle on the kernel of the issue and arrive at the good idea or the best idea and hopefully not cause uh, the next set of unintended consequences for the next board. Thank you so much. That would a great, what a great, was that enough? A great discussion. And I, again, I thank you so much for your service and uh, yeah. discussion. So it was great to have oh, you. Oh gosh, I'm glad you, I'm glad, thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate being here. I, I was gonna try to figure out how to shoehorn some more in about, you know, my my appreciation uh, for everything you've done and that what our community of, of people who are climate conscious are doing about climate change and carbon emissions. And and uh, I just wanted to say, I, I, I take it all the way back to Eunice Foote discovering the heat trapping capacity of carbon that's where i start when i when people ask me what's the big deal about climate change and i start with Eunice foot a, a woman scientist who was never recognized uh back in her day uh, but who's given credit now for discovering the heat trapping capacity of gases um but then you can go up through the years and realize we've known this was a problem for well over 100 years it's high time we did something about it right Let's do it. Teamwork. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> nice talking to you. Look there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hopefully we'll meet in person for a cup of coffee or a beer one of these days. I'd love to do that. Okay. Have a good afternoon. Right. You too. Take care.